It's 1999, and the U.S. stock market is entering a period of tech mania. High-speed internet and cell phones are just beginning to make their way into homes of ordinary Americans who are embracing the information age with open arms. One of the most loved gadgets of the era is the Palm Pilot. The grandfather of the modern smartphone, the Palm Pilot mainly is used for scheduling, storing contact info, taking notes, and performing calculations. Critically, the Palm 7, which launched in 1999, has the added capability of allowing users to access the internet wirelessly so they can check emails, look up directions, or find out sports scores and stock prices. The device is produced by a company called Palm Computing, which is a subsidiary of 3Com. In September of 1999, 3Com announces that Palm will be spun off so that the two companies can focus on independent growth initiatives. So, six months later, that's what happens. And just like that, financial world witnessed what appeared to be one of the most bizarre episodes in market history. Prior to doing the spin-off, 3Com plans an initial public offering of Palm shares. They will sell 23 million shares onto the market while continuing to hold 532 million themselves. Then, in approximately six months' time, and pending a positive ruling by the IRS on tax issues, 3Com expects to execute the spin-off by distributing one and a half shares of Palm to shareholders for each one share of 3Com they hold. The date of this initial IPO is March 3rd. So, March 3rd comes, and Palm shares go ballistic. Shares that were initially priced at $38 traded as high as $165 and closed at a still pretty extraordinary $95 per share. This shouldn't have been too much of a surprise as the company has everything going for it. Palm is the rare tech stock that's hitting the market while already being a household name. There are 5 million rabid users in the U.S., which represents a 68% share of the market. For reference, as of 2019, the iPhone has only a 45% market share in the U.S., so it's dramatically more prevalent than even the iPhone. Additionally, the company is actually profitable, which sets it apart from a lot of tech darlings of the era. And finally, the timing is exactly right. A week later, the Nasdaq reached a high that it would not surpass for another 15 years. The Washington Post put the move on the opening day in context by stating that Palm had, quote, a market capitalization of $53 billion, about as much as two stalwarts of the old economy, McDonald's Corp. and Philips Petroleum Co. put together, and more than twice that of internet high flyer Amazon.com. Hmm, they uh, might want to keep an eye on that Amazon.com company. Anyways, here's where things get interesting. If Palm shares are going to the moon, what must 3Com shares be doing? Going up, right? because they own basically all of Palm, so how could it not? Well, on the day Palm IPO'd, Freecom fell by 21%. And that's where things start getting weird. Let's think about this. In March of 2000, you could buy one share of Palm for $95, or one share of Freecom for 81 But in a few months, that share of Freecom was going to give you one and a half shares of Palm, Plus, you would still have your 3Com share. At first glance, the only way this appeared to make any sense at all was if 3Com was worse than worthless. Its value had to be so negative that an investor would rather pay more to own a single share of Palm than to own one and a half Palm with the 3Com tacked on. In the first days after the IPO, this implied value of 3Com was more than negative 50 billion. And 3Com was a profitable company on its own at the time. So, here we've got a chart that shows the implied value of 3Com if you just took the price of one share of Palm, multiplied it by 1.5, and then subtracted that from the price of 3Com. 3Com ends up having a negative value for over two months. So, does this incident demonstrate how dumb people were during the tech bubble? That they would rather pay more to have one of something than to have one and a half of that same thing? Probably to a certain extent, uh, Occam's Razor says that there has to be people out there calling up their broker and telling them to buy Palm because they or 
someone they know are addicted to the vice and they just know that problem is going to be big. But to academics, this sort of explanation is mostly unacceptable. It allows for the markets to be irrational, and they don't like that. Normally, situations such as the one between Palm and 3Com can't exist in a market because of the arbitrage opportunity. In plain speak, this means that two identical items can't trade at different prices for very long because as soon as someone figures it out, they'll take advantage, scoop up the profit, and in doing so, they'll put the market back into alignment. In this case, most people noticed right away. And in case anyone didn't, it was covered by several major business outlets after the first day of trading. Yet, that gap persisted. Over the years, solving this problem has become a source of scholarly attention, especially after a future Nobel Prize winner Richard Thaler described part of the situation by writing, quote, investors who buy apparently expensive stocks are just making a mistake. This is like a stick in the eye of traditional economists as their models rely on rational human beings. So here's the best explanations that those economists have trying to explain what was going on here. First, and most importantly, the gap between 3Com and Palm has to do with the lower number of shares available for shorting. Since one of the main ways to profit from the situation would involve betting that Palm would go down, obstacles to making this bet could distort the market. The 23 million shares that were part of the IPO were in such demand that the short ratio for Palm in its first few days of trading was reportedly close to 150%. This is way higher than anything on the market currently, with GameStop being an outlier in its own right, clocking in at about 99%. The result was not that there were no shares available to short and push down the price, but that the shares which were available came with a high cost to borrow. In other words, a person couldn't just bet prices would fall, they had to agree to pay high interest fees on the shares they had sold short that would eat into their profits and it removes a key source of downward pressure that would normally correct the gap. But how did the price get so high in the first place? Well, the flip side of this situation is even more illuminating. People holding Palm but lending it out to short sellers were making a killing in interest. Normally, an investor or institution who's loaning out stock to be shorted can make a percent or two. Palm, meanwhile, was being loaned at rates in the 30s and 40s and at times reaching as high as 60%. So, suddenly Palm and 3Com shares have an important difference. Palm shares are making holders a ton of interest, while the 3Com shares are not. So you can't anymore say, well, we're just comparing 1 versus 1.5. Another key point is there was still some uncertainty about the 1.5 shares of Palm that all 3Com holders were getting. They were supposed to get their shares sometime in the next six months, and that was assuming that the IRS gave them the ruling they were looking for. Then, May 8, 2000, 3Com announced they had received the ruling, it went their way, and that the spin-off was going to happen in July. This was sooner than most people had been expecting. Immediately, the prices moved toward one another, a reaction that proved the preceding theories. And from this point forward, 3Com was never viewed as having negative value again when you compare the Palm price to the 3Com price. 3Com was now free to rise and reflect the value of Palm shares it was holding because outside of something like another firm buying them out and halting the spin-off from the inside, there was no more uncertainty that the 3Com shares were going to get you one and a half shares of Palm. Also, Palm was now worth less because the huge interest that holders were gaining if they were able to lend out their shares was going to be coming to an end a couple months sooner than they'd been expecting. The work of professors defending a rational market is it's interesting, and uh, links to their work are in the description for you to inspect yourself, but I can't help but side with Thaler here. The price discrepancy was made worse by the uncertainty in the short lending situation for sure, but what about all the retail investors who never see a dime from lending out their shares? That entire class of people seem to be making a mistake, just as Thaler says. The scholars try to explain these people, but they really do a much less compelling job. As much as they don't want to admit it, I think that just sometimes markets are overwhelmed with people being people. 
many of whom in this instance had no idea what was going on. As evidence of this, I submit this passage from the Motley Fool message board that I pulled up from way back in 2000. It's from a user called Convict at Large. He's writing this after effectively all uncertainty should be removed from the trade. He says, Forgive this novice fool if he is asking a stupid question, but I bought my comm shares at 42.75 a couple months ago. Now, as I understand it, part of that valuation included the palm shares. So, what is likely to happen to the value of comm shares after the palm giveaway? What do you think, foolish ones? Will the value drop sharply and then regain its worth later on, or what? As I bought the share at a higher price, am I likely to still make a profit on the comm shares in the long term? Please help this confused student fool. This guy is already invested, yet he's crying out for help. And I'm sure he's just one of millions of people that were in that same situation. Sometimes the market is bigger than math. It will tell you that for some people, 1 is greater than 1.5 and you just have to believe it since you can see it with your own two eyes. And this was one of those times. And that's what makes this a moment in stock history. Thanks for watching guys.